So I thought maybe first we'd do first impressions because we arrived separately to the, the first day. Um, and you saw more of it than I did. So um, on Monday, it was amazing. These four sites had sprung up overnight as if by magic. And we're not just talking about roadblocks, which there were at Oxford Circus, Parliament Square, and Marble Arch and Waterloo Bridge, but full stages, fully amplified solar stages at each of these locations, marquees for well-being, um, vegetarian and vegan kitchens for donations, induction tents, places where you could go and get your clothing printed with Extinction Rebellion you know, to branding and anything that you can imagine. It was basically, I, I'm calling it a climate awareness festival. It was incredibly peaceful, really, really chilled out, tents set up sort of near every single roadblock. Um, and it just arrived, I arrived to assist a friend at the wellbeing tent. And um, what, you know, what was your first impression? Because you saw. When did I. When did, I when did you arrive? I'm sorry. So <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I was there for 11 days. Yeah, which day was the first day? So I was <laughs> completely like. Um, yeah, what was the well, first you, day? You did all of the sites on the first day. Well, I, was just, I was just with my friend. Where were you? <laughs> I was in Parliament Square. What were you doing? I was with Rose. Shall I tell yeah, you some things on. you told me? Yeah, go on then. So you told me that you'd been to Waterloo Bridge and that they'd set up a line of trees all along yeah, the middle of it. It was amazing. Yeah. It was lovely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely beautiful. Um, and that you know, there was a, a truck solar stage on Waterloo Bridge, mm -hmm. um, and people people speaking from it. This was true at all of the all of the sites. Um, you had like live live musicians, but also in, inspirational speakers, workshops, basically everything you needed to find out more. And um, once you got in past the roadblocks, it didn't feel like a protest at all because there was nothing uh, about it that told you that it wasn't purely a festival that was there by permission. And there was, um, what do you call the green tents? What were they called? The in, in, were they in the in, in induction tents? Induction tents. So basically they were offering like information. I didn't actually go to one because I was just like, yeah, I'll just figure it out as I go along. <laughs> That's kind of my style. But they had, like, on the hour, I think every hour, they had induction tent, um, induction sessions for people to show up at each of the four sites. I think there were five sites at that point. Um, to go along to that tent and to basically find out what options there were available to, to get involved. Whether, and there were so many different roles. That, like, I saw people at so many different points kind of um, a friend of mine ended up doing helping out in one of the kitchens, doing some cooking, there was like, just doing stuff like washing up. There was welfare team who were just kind of offering guidance or support. There were people offering workshops and kind of like yoga and meditation sessions in the well-being areas. There was a sort of regeneration for people who kind of gone out into one of the sites and had either been there a long time or retired, or they simply kind of just arrived and gone. Oh my God, this is really overwhelming and suddenly feeling all the grief, which happened to me at various points really unexpectedly over the 11 days of suddenly just going, oh my God, all the polar bears are dying. <laughs> Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, to yeah, interject. Please. Did they have any, because I understand the grief, and as I said, there's a dark side to it, which is the end of the world, or no, it doesn't get any darker than that for us. Were there, in addition to induction tents and anything like that, the trees and the whatever, were there any kind of rituals or, not rituals, but almost like moments where people gathered together and grieved together. Yeah. There were? Yeah, oh, there, great. there were all sorts cool. of different things. For example, I don't know if any of you know, there were five rhythms as a sort of spiritual dance practice. So there were five rhythms practitioners at most of the sites, but particularly at the Waterloo Bridge site, which was overseen by people from the southwest, so kind of Bristol in this area of the country. Yay. Um, and mm -hmm. there was like, that was sort of <laughs> the most hippie site, as I would call it. That's <laughs> <laughs> where I went. <laughs> I kind of got my hippie side and my London side, so I kind of flipped between the two. But um, at that site, yeah, there were a lot of kind of like sitting in circles and meditations, and it was all focused around basically allowing ourselves to open and to feel sure. the enormity of what was going on. So it wasn't so much like it was kind of full on protest, rah. There was, wasn't really much of that. It was more just let's all come together, sit in right, the yeah. street, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Because the purpose <coughs> of it was to physically, I mean, I think the three things they said on the induction sort of posters were like, come along, sit down, literally just <laughs> sit down in the street and just be here. Yeah. And it was simply presence, that's what they were looking for, just mm -hmm. simply body presence on the ground. 
and it was always really clear at any time like whether it was dangerous or sort of arrestable to be anywhere at any particular point, which most of the time, 99% of the time, it wasn't. Uh, there was no um, threat to safety because there was really clear indications in place as to what one had to do if you wanted to be arrested. <laughs> so it was more like, you know, if you want to be arrested, come and talk to us and we'll find something for you to do that will, <laughs> that will like, help you get arrested. Because well, actually, bang off, here's a checklist, do this. No, seriously, but they weren't, yeah. they weren't like kind of vandalism or anything like that. Were, none of them were like negative actions. It was more like sit here and even if you're asked to move, don't move. Mm. That was as far as it went in terms Crazy, of getting yeah. arrested. I mean, civil disobedience, yeah. which is yeah. non-violent, can really only go as far as being in the wrong place. Yeah. Um, uh, well, the, being the, the, uh, being yeah, being to the wrong thing, thing. thing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> being chained or glued to the wrong thing. Yeah. That was <laughs> as far as it went in terms of things that were causing arrests. There were a, cu t a couple of arrests for vandalism, but most of the stuff. But, but yes, there people were leaving kind of marks on the pavements on the side of the street in chalk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I and then they washed off. Mm -hmm. And then, and then yeah. they spent. You know, there's a beautiful article in the Metro today about how all the sites were basically hand cleared and hand cleaned by all the rebels before they left. So it was left perfect. And mm -hmm. I, I watched people scrubbing, scrubbing, scrubbing the, exactly. the chalk exactly. off the pavements exactly last night. Yeah. So for those of you who have just come in, we were <laughs> describing the experience of arriving in London and seeing the four main sites. And what I was thinking is, if we could just give you a really clear picture of what those different sites look like, we've, we've described Waterloo Bridge a bit, but to give you a bit of a, a visual description of what it was like being at each one, um, and then to, you know, to go on from there and, and feel free to interject with questions. Um, so, at Parliament Square, as you can imagine, this um, very famous location, this green square with a, in the middle, they had a a solar stage, and that was pretty much mainly it was it was talks. Occasionally there'd be some singing, but that was that was mainly a, an area for talks, and it was about finding out more. What do you mean by solar stage? Oh uh, yeah, okay. So I think it was solar, um, powered by solar panels. Some of them were battery powered, but yeah. In any case, it was as low am impact as possible. Um, then at Oxford Circus, um, there was. The stage was a, was a pink boat. You might have seen the images mm -hmm. <laughs> right on the main crossroads. Do you remember the theme for Parliament Square? Because they all have different now. themes. Yes. Is that okay? No, that's the bridge. Yeah, oh, that's really? Yeah, the bridge is out now. Bridge. What's the Parliament Square? I don't remember. Uh, I remember tell the, the Truth. Which was really no, no, tell the Truth is Oxford Circus. So Oxford Circus was Tell the Truth. So a lot of the um, actions and the sort of uh, speakers and performers that were taking place in Oxford Circus were all about truth saying, truth telling. The the idea of that site was to kind of really get home the message that the government needs to tell the truth about the enormity of what's going on and the threat that's going on and in a way that's kind of been known for thirty years but hasn't really been fully fully to well hardly anything told to the public. Um, so that so yeah there was the big pink boat in Oxford Circus and at various different points there were speakers or performers um, there was often a DJ, and it was kind of about rousing. But at least for the first week, it was very much about rousing the energy and getting people excited and giving flyers out to the public and giving out stickers and just getting people kind of hearing about what was going on, which was a very, very, very different energy to... We, took, we spoke about Waterloo Bridge, which was... What was that at now? So Waterloo Bridge was, was about, you know... Um, they made it a green bridge, as we said before, full of trees and shrubs, and they had garden a, a garden bridge. That's mm. right, exactly. Um, and they had, again, lots of different performances and talks and workshops and kind of, it, it, was, much, it was much more sort of um, peaceful and <laughs> sat down, I guess, <laughs> than Oxford Circus was. And then Parliament Square, I can't remember the theme for Parliament Square, but um, like Kimway said, they had this solar stage, but um, it was, again, it was mostly kind of people sitting around, there were, there were lots of well-being stuff going on, there were workshops. Um, Is it Citizens' Assembly? This is assembly happened at all of them, I think. But I think was that the theme for Parliament Square? I I don't know why I can't remember that. Yeah, people's assembly. Yeah, it was. That did happen there. And there it was. That was the theme there. Okay. And then there was Marble Arch was the camp, essentially. It was the highest populated camp. There were tents covering all of the grass. Sound like 
Um, and yeah, again, again, a stage there. That was the music stage. Uh, bands Monday to Wednesday, as far as was possible, and then the program became more and more disrupted as the week went on. So um, at first, when he went along, they was it was completely impossible to publish a program, but you would have like const constant um, performers of some kind or workshops of some kind happening in each location. And there was also Piccadilly Circus, which was um, Extinction Rebellion Youth, which was a focal point only, I think, for the first day or two, um, which then got opened back up again. I never actually made it down to Piccadilly Circus. I was ping-ponging between those four kind of at pretty regular intervals over those, over those four urban days, although I suppose we lost Oxford Circus at the weekend and we lost Waterloo Bridge a few days ago. So right till the end, we had Parliament Square and um, Harbour Arch. No, I was at Piccadilly Circus quite early on, and I, one thing I remember about it clearly was that because it was it, the, the only one that was just on a, a road, it was really obvious whenever an emergency vehicle came through, just something that happened at every single site, emergency vehicles were always allowed through, and so that was very obvious at, at Piccadilly Circus, everyone would have to go, and then back on again, mm -hmm. and that happened very, very quickly and easily. I saw it happen once at Oxford Circus, and it was utterly amazing. There were just like thousands of people sat down on the ground and there was a DJ playing and suddenly there was a siren and everyone just jumped up and ran to the side of the street. The whole street was clear within like five seconds and the ambulance came through and everyone went back down in. So that was the kind of, that really spoke to me in terms of the, the nature and the sensitivity and the sort of absolute commitment that everybody had on an individual level. Nobody needed to be told, get up and move. They just did it totally peacefully and then sat back down again. So after describing the sites, the next thing that I wanted to um, really share about the experience of being there was the, the two different sides of the rebellion being at these sites. And the one side was disruption, to make waves by disrupting our capital city by the nature of those sites being roadblocks in, in very active, well, are there any inactive parts of central London, but you know what I mean. So there's that aspect of it, and um, those people who were at the forefront of making sure that disruption was maintained were the ones who would be arrested. And then the other side of it is the experience that Extinction Rebellion were able to provide that would allow people to engage fully with the issue of climate change. Um, and I wanted to um, ask, you know, ask your experience of this as well, because our experiences were so completely different. Um, and my experience was to have a, a few years of, of history of learning about climate change and going through the emotional processes that go with it and arriving to the protest with a clear role because I had um, at least one role in uh, contributing to the movement and I acquired another one. So I had things that I knew that I was doing. But at the same time, I noticed that the protest was providing space for all different kinds of intellectual, emotional, physical reactions. So they were um, accounting for people needing more information, people needing to know that they could take action, people needing some time out just to feel, maybe in the wellbeing tent or in a workshop, and people having time to engage also with music and art that would help them to process these emotions. So one of the things that I kept saying over the time to various people was, in your time off, from taking action, you are still doing the work of changing the world because it's important that we remain feeling empowered by continuing to engage with what we feel um, around these issues. And so that was very easy for me, but I noticed that every time I started to feel not very useful, I would have lengthy, uh, I'd have an emotional drop because it's difficult to engage with something so big if you don't feel you can do anything. But you had a different experience because you arrived without a role and without as much information to start with. I was popping to the loop, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I basically turned up on Monday simply to come say hi to Kimway um, and to just see what he was up to. And uh, I was there with a friend, I remember now. Um, and <laughs> my brain's just fuzzled. Um, and I came along and I was like, whoa, this is just immense. And it reminded me of like, 
being at like some of my favourite forms of like conscious festivals with just loads of amazing people all kind of gathered in one place. I saw loads of people I knew. I was just like, my God, this is amazing. And I knew very, very little about it. Now, um, I'm a science communicator, so it's not like I don't know anything about climate change. However, it's not something that I've really kind of got engaged with or, or really stopped to find out much about because it's not something that I've particularly researched. So I came along kind of thinking, oh, this is fun. You know, let's just have a sort of, as a voyeur kind of thing. Um, and very quickly got swept up into the sort of energy and the intensity of what was going on. And then when I started to read people's posts on Facebook and speak to Kimwe a bit about his experiences and his knowledge of, of the issues around climate change, I was just like, what? Like, how come we don't know all this stuff? Like, how come we don't know that we've got 12 years before it's irreversible and catastrophic? How come we don't know? Like, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you guys do, but... I sort of knew in the back of my head, but it, it just wasn't that obvious. And I think being there, and I obviously, like I said, I, I've sort of been aware of it, of course, you know, I'm a scientist, you can't not, but there was something of this sort of like connect, collective sort of inertia and this collective blindness or this collective, what's that word when you put your blinkers on and you just go, yeah, yeah, it'll be fine. And then suddenly I was looking around and there were people with placards and posters saying, you know, at now, or we're all going to die, basically. And I was like, oh my God. And then I was walking around seeing pictures of like different animal species that had gone extinct in the last 20, 30, 40 years, and then pictures of other animal species and when they were going to go extinct. And it was like very visual kind of representations of stuff. <coughs> and very, very quickly, I kind of went, oh wow, this is like, this is really huge and this is really important. And I went quite quickly from being a sort of um, voyeur, a sort of spectator, as such, kind of walking around and just kind of like feeling like I was on the edge, looking in, like kind of if you go to an event and there's lots of actors or whatever. And then quite quickly I was like, well, is there anything that I can actually do? And I think to begin with, did I get a drum? <laughs> <laughs> I can't really remember, but I, I, I was sort of following Kim very well for a while and just that made me feel like I had a sort of a vague reason to be there. But then quite quite quickly I started to realise that one thing that I felt that I could do was that I, I knew that it was such a shock to my system that there was this huge thing going on and that there was so much stuff we hadn't been told and hadn't really properly thought about that it made me realise that there's so many people out there in the world, intelligent, educated, you know, uh, informed people who also don't really, really, really get it, not with the absolute urgency and the alarm that suddenly I felt. So I kind of decided that what I was going to do was just basically post photos and I wrote like a blog every day on my, my public Facebook profile and I've got uh, over 10,000 followers on Twitter. So I was just posting stuff and posting stuff and going, well, the, the, the least I can do, the only thing I can think to do is do what I do best, which is communicate and, and kind of go from what's going on here sort of out into the world. So in a way, it was I, I sort of took on a bit of a spectatory role in a sense because I was kind of like watching and reporting, <coughs> um, but it made me feel that there was something I could do because otherwise, at moments, like Kenway said, there was such a sense of like the enormity of what was going on and like what can we actually do? The powerlessness. Can you take that slide, Jess? Um, yeah. So I. I um, I think, I, I don't know if you remember this, but I think kind of maybe on the first or so, it might even have been on the first night, um, that it was, you'd had a lovely day in, in the festival effectively, and then it got to the point where they were starting to make arrests, and you had this feeling of wanting to go and rush off and get arrested, and I think I said something like, I don't think that's the best use of your skill set. Right <laughs> <laughs> but what, what I really enjoy about uh, this movement is that it is so huge and so clear on what it wants to achieve and how that there is room for so many people to do what they do best mm -hmm. and contribute that way. Yeah, like I invited a friend along and he grabbed a drum and ended up banging the drum for three or four hours with the, in Samba Band, which I'd never, also, I'd never picked up a drum and I ended up doing that as well on day two and then literally every day through till day 11 as well, and kind of banging a cowbell by the end. And so just learning new skills and actually um, seeing that as a contribution. But this friend who joined, he then messaged me the next day saying that he'd just spent five hours in the kitchen because he enjoys cooking and he was like, I can offer that. And there were, just, there were legal observers, there were people who knew something about the law who could watch the police and, and check that they were following the guidelines <coughs> and abiding by the law in terms of how they were making arrests. 
and there were just people doing so many different things behind the scenes. Everything from being like a narrator on the, on the stage and actually speaking about it to just literally just sitting on the ground and sitting there for hours and hours on end, just kind of sitting calmly and peacefully in protest, or people leading groups in song, or, I mean, there was just so many different ways to get involved, and that's, I think, what I was trying to impress upon the people that I was reaching out to in my following, which was that there was this assumption, people started messaging me saying, oh, you know, your rebellion, or how, how do we join your team? And I'm like, I'm, I, I don't have a team, it's just come along and show up, and take on and just do stuff. There's nobody to ask, there's nobody to kind of tell you what to do. It's, as such, there were these induction areas. But there's also just opportunities to just show up and go, well, how do I feel I can get involved? I ended up taking a pile of stickers at one point and just going down Regent Street and sticking stickers on all the shoppers, just going, look, come and join us, come and join us. Mm -hmm. So it was just finding things to do. Um, so I think that probably leads us on to how the, um, how the organisation uh, functions. And um, I did want to ask you about that because I know you were at a People's Assembly and I wasn't. Um, yeah, I went to about three of them. Mm. My, un my understanding is that Extinction Rebellion wants the involvement of people who align with its core values and that that is the, the key aspect of it and that it, have it I've read through again those core values today and it seems that what comes across most strongly, it's quite, it's quite a lengthy document, but most strongly is that the aim is for everyone's voice to be heard and for everyone's voice to matter and for that culture to empower everybody. Um, and one of the things that was done for the first time was that there was a people's assembly at, at Marble Arch um, at which the person running it said this is the first time ever that uh, Rebellion has discussed its next movement with both the police and the press watching. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you'd say something about the People's Assembly, well, one of the People's Assembly you attended and how it felt and how it worked. It was honestly the most incredibly moving display of true democracy that I've ever experienced. I mean, I've sat in circles before and I've been to workshops and done a lot of kind of... Um, Hi, good morning. Come on, girl. Um, but I've never seen an organisation ever that's been run <coughs> in such a democratic way. I mean, there were moments... I'll come back to the Assembly in a second, but what brought it home to me was there were moments when we were helping with the Samba band. There was a moment where I had a chance to kind of um, share something that I'd learned with the group and I immediately switched into a sort of leadership role because... I run workshops and I run courses, so I'm used to playing that role. And when I was sitting and listening, I was kind of listening, okay, that's the leader, okay, I'm listening. And suddenly I realised that this is not how it works here. <laughs> and I had to actually like smack myself in the hand and go, hang on a minute, I'm so entrenched in this like dictatorship hierarchical system where like you have a leader attending one time, and everybody listens and, t and they tell you what to do. And I suddenly realised within even our small samba band, that was completely not the way it works. It was all about there are no leaders, there are um, only people who are putting forward the opinions of others or who are facilitating the space at any one time. And that was within our, our small group that was the Samba Band that we both played in. But to extend that, yeah? I'm very, in, I mean, I was very involved in Occupy, and I, I, as Kim Wayne knows, Kim Wayne was as well, and I'm very interested to know, maybe you can weave it in, but how, I, and I think Central Rebellion is massively more successful than Occupy, so I wonder how, just what the differences were. But you don't have oh, yeah. to answer that now. Maybe I, that's a question you can, can come through. I can later. Yeah. But I didn't want to interrupt you cool. because that was very interesting. So what I was going to say is that that then sort of feeds into my experience of the People's Assembly, which was honestly one of the most humbling, and I cried just because it was so beautiful. I, I observed the first one. I observed two of them, and then in, on the third one, I actually uh, allowed myself to feel like I could actually sit in a group and actually have an opinion, because at the beginning I was like, well, I'm not really part of the movement, I'm just sort of observing it and taking photos. And then I was like, well, hang on a minute, that actually, by what they're saying, that means I am. Um, so the first two I watched, it was just so beautiful. So the person who was facilitating basically said, this is the questions we want, these are the two, the two questions we want you to consider. I think at that point it was, should we give up the boat in Oxford Circus to the police in order to keep this Oxford Circus safe over the bank holiday weekend because basically drunk Londoners were kind of coming and partying mm -hmm. 
totally against the ethos of Extinction Rebellion, and it was making everything unsafe. So should we relinquish the vote to the police, and if so, how should we do that? Um, so that was the question that was put. It was about midnight, because it had all just suddenly started to get out of hand. It came really spontaneously. Everyone sat on the ground, and the, I keep wanting to say leader, not the leader, the facilitator, um, just basically said, those are the questions we want you to consider. We allow women to sit in groups of six to eight, and then she gave us a load of sort of suggestions as to how to run our little discussion circle. So she was like, have a facilitator in each group, have a note taker, make sure everyone gets to speak, um, encourage <coughs> those who are, who are more intro introverted or more held back, more shy, um, practice active listening. So look at people when they're talking, really listen to them, really engage, but don't speak whilst they're speaking, don't speak over each other, and then she taught us some hand signals of like, which I'm sure some of you might know from, I've never seen these before, like if somebody had a direct point they wanted to make off the back of what somebody else was saying. Uh, there was just lots of different ways to kind of keep the group really fair and make everyone's voice heard. And, and then at the end, so everyone was split into these um, groups and then everyone came back together and she asked one representative from each group to kind of pull together the thoughts of, of their small group and report back with just with like one sentence on the topic that was that we've been asked to comment on and the thing that really struck me is she said at the end she said I'm not very good at remembering words because it's much better than me but she said something like okay everybody it's like a thousand people sat down she said how do you feel did you feel heard did you feel seen did you feel you got a chance to express how you felt did you feel you got a chance to say your opinion? Did people listen to you? Do you feel, do you feel good? And the whole of the assembly just sort of nodded and she said, right, that is how democracy should feel. Mm. And I was just like, just total spine tingles. It was just absolutely beautiful. So I went to whichever ones I could find after that and was just like sucking it in, absorbing it in, going, I need to change my whole framework of what being with people, being part of a team, actually feels like and what it looks like. I'll stop talking now. <laughs> I talk a lot. <laughs> That's, that is the answer, isn't it? You've, that, you've got your answer. Was that yeah, your answer? Yeah, 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 that yeah, answer yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Um, so, I th probably I want to talk about the, the samba band and then I want to talk about arrests. Um, the only reason I want to talk about the Samba Band is because it is the most of my experience. Um, so I can talk about it. Uh, it is... A Samba Band is, is a, it's a marching band, but it's not marching band music. It's not military music. It's a drum band. Um, there's no, there's no mu um, instruments in it. I got so confused. For the whole week, I was like, when are drums? Uh, <laughs> there is Oh, yeah. that's, that's what he says every time I say that. I'm sorry, I keep. I there's can't. no pitch. There's no melody. I was like, it's written. Yeah, yeah. It's I entirely. Didn't it. I was like, where's the trumpet? <laughs> it is an entirely it's a drum band. It's entirely a drum band. Um, and and the, yeah, yeah. And, and the and um, the reason it's most it's so useful to um, any kind of protest is that it provides entertainment and it can move. So for any of the marches, and there were some between sites that were organised um, that worked, the samba band would be part of those where possible. Also, once you're moving... There's also an amazing morale lifter. Are you Amber? No. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind then. Did you, did you hear us? Yeah. No, oh, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so it was, it was music for it dancing, purpose, for, for the... rousing. Exactly. People. And it was also really on the edge of, of arrestability, <coughs> which was very convenient. So the police had said to us, most of the time, as long as you're moving, we're fine with that. And even in the street, even yeah, in traffic. Well. And we were blocking three lanes of traffic at some point, and, and the police would walk with us as if escorting us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and sometimes we would stop on the crossroads and for up to 10 minutes at a time. I think it's meant to be from the five to seven, so I'd say sometimes we exceeded that a bit, and even so, it was just on that edge of You're the rest of the minutes. minutes. You're allowed yeah. seven yeah. minutes. I thought it was that. Okay. Um, so, so we were doing that, and also we were firing from the edges of the bands, and people would come out to, 
to see us come out into the street from buildings or wave to us from, from their homes. So it was a really effective part of the protest and it was also quite disruptive at any time where there were a lot of police <coughs> at a site trying to arrest people. Just the kind of the hubbub and the buzz of the Samba band arriving and parading around the site because of course we couldn't stay in one place so we sort of have to go around the site and that would just kind of dis disrupt things and, and be, uh, I'm not sure of a distracting force but it was just, I, so I want to say it was a wonderful useful piece of protest but what I want to say to go with that is that um, most, of the, most of the numbers of people in it had never drummed before there was a core team of maybe a core band of maybe 15 people, some of which who were there for two days of rehearsal before the start, and then were there fully for you know almost two weeks at that point, drumming every day, um, probably starting at midday-ish and running right through to 10 o'clock at night, roughly. So they were incredibly long hours of drumming and marching, and did a wonderful job. After the, the main leader, who's a, a really good friend of mine, and that's why I was asked up in, in the role of, of helping with the samba band, after he had to go back home after a week, and other people who had learned on the fly took over, um, e including some people who had never drummed before that week. So I just wanted to sh give that as such an example of how, when it comes to a cause, it's amazing how quickly people are able to learn and support each other to learn and how the ethos of Extinction Rebellion was so, so much, you can, you can and we want you to. And it, you know, if there was someone who came forward as a leader who was less experienced, other people in the main band would s find how to support them in that because they wanted them to be able to, whether they wanted the whole band to be able to function. So there was a huge uh, amount of support that came forward. Um, from people who could already drum or from people who'd been there even just one day longer. And people would just come in from the sidelines. Like, as Kimway said, one of the roles of the band was to kind of raise morale of the people who'd been sitting in roadblocks for like 10, 20, 30 hours on a trot, the, the arrestables, as we called them, the ones who were sitting, we'll talk about arrest in a minute, who were sitting on the roadblocks, who were getting really tired and low morale, and the police would be start coming in, and then the samba band would arrive, and just everyone would get excited, and it would draw a crowd, and that's exactly what we needed, was lots and lots of people around. Because mm. the more people there were, then the harder it was for the site to be cleared. So people would just flock in, who had been sort of standing at a distance and filming on their mobile phones. They'd suddenly come in and start dancing, and then someone would hand them a drum, or a cowbell or something, and they'd just join in, and that would be it. Then they'd be like on the team for the next, the samba team for like the next week or whatever. Yeah, so it's true. I mean, I one of the key po like moments that I remember was when we were at Oxford Circus and the police were preparing to take the boat away. And um, the samba band had obviously got wind of this and they were coming along. And, and Emily came to me and said, is, is this the right thing to do? Should they be coming here? Because we'd also got information that once the boat started moving, actually there was a better place that we could have probably put the band that might cut the boat off. As and it also we wanted quite a somber atmosphere in, the, in Oxford Circus. That's true, sort of like yeah. a, um, like almost like a vigil. And it was very calm and very peaceful there at that point. And I was like, oh my God, it's like this little huge samba man arriving. It's going to make everyone go bonkers. Exactly. So yeah, yeah, exactly. So somebody said, is this, should we change their direction? I was like, I think we probably should. So off we went. <laughs> off, to, off to intercept them, off to talk to the, the person at the front. Like, Walking along Bond Street. Yeah, exactly. So can, we, can we change this? And, and then I saw them. I was just like, we can't stop this. Because including the people who had just joined, to, uh, the musicians and the people who had just joined in to walk with the band, it was way more than 100 strong. And we were just, well... It was like literally okay. walking into a tidal wave of, of energy. <laughs> like, OK, we're not stopping this. Yeah. This is coming. There's no way of turning this around. It had just become this huge, massive support. And it was going to come and, and support where, where, bring that energy to Oxford Circus. And it was a wonderful thing when it happened. Hello. Um, yeah. Can I just ask, um, you said you'd have a, a, a people's uh, assembly and you'd discuss whether or not to take the boat out of uh, its location. Did everybody agree that it should be taken out for so it was a group say that it was like it? it was a seven to four um, uh, vote of the 11 groups that were there 
and there was a seven to four agreement that we should negotiate with the police in order to keep everybody safe. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't clear what that would involve, what the outcome of that would be, but what the outcome ended up being was the consensual removal of the boat in a sort of ceremonial way, mm -hmm. taking a long time with lots of arrests, which is what the movement wanted, um, in order to keep the area safe over the weekend. Can you elaborate on that point you made of you wanted more arrests? Was that to yeah. raise the profile of the action? Yeah, to let's, let's talk about arrests. So that's probably the, the final point that we want to look at before we open this to you. Um, it's a civil disobedience movement, and arrests are really the central part <coughs> of it. Uh, when you have people willing to be arrested for a cause, that <coughs> is a huge message. And also, um, as I said at the beginning, it's a figure that can't be manipulated. An amount of arrests is, is as it is, and it can't be inflated or deflated. Um, so the process for being arrested would be that you'd have to be breaking the law. And I believe the police, I, I paraphrase, but the police um, issued a, a kind of statement saying, we haven't encountered this before, these people are friendly and um, very nice, but they are also breaking the law, and it's not something that they've had to react to before. Uh, so the, the sort of, the ceremony of the arrest would be that somebody is in the wrong place. This could be anything from they're glued to the pink boat, or they are sitting blocking the road with a group of other people. Now, they have to be told, if you keep doing that, we will arrest you. And then they have to be seen to have understood this and continue to do it. After a little while, say five minutes or so, they can then be arrested. And it seemed that this needed to happen sort of one at a time. They didn't seem to do that to a whole row in a, a roadblock. So arrests would take a long time. The police arrived at Oxford Circus, I think, around about so sometime between midday and, uh, yeah, maybe around kind of midday to one, and they weren't actually able to start moving the boat until 7.30. They spent so long arresting people throughout the day. And the thing was as well is that at, at, the, at the boat it was slightly different because they'd kettled it, which basically means they'd surrounded it. So when they, as they picked people off one at a time, and un unlocked them from the boat or carried them away, um, no one else could come in. But at the other site, what they would do is they would go to the roadblock and they would caution that person. They'd say, you know, we ask you to move. And they're like, well, okay. And <laughs> apparently, one, apparently a policeman said to someone, can you please take this seriously? Because <laughs> <laughs> they were just laughing, saying, sorry, what did you say? Oh, no, <laughs> oh, no I don't want to move. And they'd just start singing. No, no, no. And they'd be singing and swaying and there'd be kids there and the police would be like, Okay, and then they'd spend ages like reading the warning and getting this person, <laughs> and they'd pick them up and carry them away, and then someone else would sit down. <laughs> and this just went on for hours. And the more people there were, the more there would just be another person then sitting in their place. So it, it, that's why the police ended up at a lot of the sites just sort of going away and stopping bothering after a time because they just they couldn't clear it enough to actually clear the road to let the cars back through. Yeah. And um, what if somebody was blocking the way with a child on their lap? Um, could they, it sounds like a dilemma. The I'm not sure what the... I don't know. The, the, I don't there know were definitely happened. teenagers. There were protocols but, for that. Um, I can step in here because I used to be a probation officer. Okay. Um, they can actually get a responsible adult to take care of the child. Okay. Um, and there are protocols for um, getting another member of the family to look after the child while I think that pregnant woman was arrested three times in the end. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, was, she was one of the front runners. She was the one who was on the boat. 
Oh, um, right. Yeah. Um, the question. Yeah. My question is a bit of long-winded, but um, don't you have to go too well to ask it, but um, how do international rebellions expect to change an intellectual awareness of a problem into a gut response in perhaps the same way that people didn't realize in the past that the profit making of the cigarette manufacturers and the results of their backroom boys research and the effects it was having on the planet on several levels, both as a culture and taking up space instead of food or something like that maybe. Um, until people suddenly realized that it was killer. Yeah. Um, and so how do extinction rebellion change the actual feeling of people so that they are impelled to action simply on a primal level of this is our habitat? Mm -hmm. Because from what I can see, the, the, the most apposite thing I can think of to go with it is that abbot, uh, not, not abbot or priest or somebody in the past that said, um, yeah, first they came for, and my, my thing is, first they came for the plains, yeah, and they turned them to corn and there was nobody to fight for them, and then they came for the trees, and there was no oxygen to breathe by, and then they came for the humans, and there was nobody left to fight for them. Mm -hmm. Extinction. Mm -hmm. It's uh, they, 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 yeah. profit. Not telling the truth about <coughs> the effects mm. that chemicals, pesticides, mm. antibiotics, uh, the use of cattle for food rather than a much more diverse and healthy diet that we could all have, mm. which would reduce the need for lots of other things. Blah, 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 blah. We all know this. Uh, we know this. Yeah. <laughs> but my point is, how do you get to the gut rather than the internet? I think that's what this movement's done now. I really do, because I mean, uh, what really moved me was the the teenagers on the front line at Heathrow when they did yeah. anyone see the clip of the the two young people who went to Heathrow and nothing much happened there in the end, but they were they were crying on, on I think it was Sky News and just saying, yeah, what are we going to do? And of course you've got Greta going into Parliament, you know, age what is she, fourteen, sixteen, sixteen, crazy. Um, so, uh, and I really do think it has become a gut response, but you have a... Yeah, I have a response for... Uh, is it... Shall I respond first, or...? I was just going to say, it's the youth strike that's been happening. Mm. You know, it's actually, you experience that, the feeling. That's the, <coughs> that's the gut. That's mm. the gut feeling. Yeah, but and just because there's a lot of publicity... Yeah. Okay, I, I, I understand your question. There's a lot of people... Yeah who have right. that gut feeling. I it could just be like some of the tabloids, sensationalism, and people get hold of something, and this will sell newspapers. So um, my response is that what I've observed Extinction Rebellion do is to um, make a space for the holistic person, for the whole person. Um, so we have a, a very disconnected society, and uh, one of the things that was re you know, repeatedly came to me from various friends independently of each other was that there was an, uh, they were experiencing an enormous amount of feedback of people having life-changing experiences of connection within Extinction Rebellion. So um, there's, there's a disconnection that's encouraged by our consumeristic society. Extinction Rebellion continually added um, structural elements that made people connect with themselves, with each other. Uh, with their emotions and with nature. And these were um, completely scheduled. So they would have uh, spiritual services for those for, for whom that worked. They had um, talks about reconnecting with nature, experiential workshops for that. They had a constant, what's, what's, what's the right way of putting it? Um, invitations. So um, to connect with each other. So occasionally somebody managing a stage would get up and say, I just want everyone to turn to the person next to me and share something. 
or to you know, to say to say something in particular, to say something loving or caring. Mm -hmm. And that was almost that was happening almost as as an invisible emotional structure that was holding people through their process, so that this information wouldn't just go. I think that was quite facilitated as well by managing um, interactions with the police, because there was a lot of talk at a lot of the sites of how, of how to support that kind of collaboration, almost, with the police, which was that, I know, <laughs> okay, that's my own word, but like, there, was, there, was a, there was definitely a sense of kind of like, turn to a policeman and tell them, tell them you love them, or like, there was a chance at one point to the police saying, we're doing this for your children too. Um, or just turn to someone sitting next to you and, and look into their eyes. And it was just really, really, really beautiful. And it really worked because everyone was so riled up at various points that it actually just helped. And there was at one point where someone started shouting out something critical from the crowd or, or somebody drunk wandered along. I think that was it. And as a group, um, the, 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 lead, the, the, the person who was speaking at that point just basically called out to him, we love you. And he just kind of crumbled because there was just so much love. There was no, there was no antagonism. There was no criticism. It was all just like, okay, you're not quite with us yet, or you haven't quite got it yet. But how can we love you into submission? But you know, how can we love you into getting it? Um, so I think that yeah, as a sort of crystalline like centerpiece to the the answer to to your question, uh, for me is that we're looking at damage that's been done by humans that are disconnected from the planet and each other. And so I believe that by putting that at the center of the experience that um, the, the Extinction Rebellion aim to create, they are providing the container that's needed for people to drop into their emotional reaction and not purely the information. Mm. Can I ask a question that's slightly disconnected? Mm. Was, were there people part of Extinction Rebellion whose tactics were different? Were there people in balaclava bombing smashing things? Surprisingly, I mean, I was really surprised. <coughs> and that one of the things we talked about before going to, uh, going to the process, that surely at some point somebody will be the maverick and there'll, there'll be a violent incident. Nothing of that. The, the, I, at the one pe a point I saw a piece of footage a policeman was, was, was carrying someone and everything, and they tripped. And that was really the best they could find of something even slightly, you know, n not as planned. But there was, yeah, I, I didn't hear of any, hear or see any, any violence or any break. I saw some wonderful like, moments where, obviously there were people who'd been awake for nine, hours, nine days, had, who'd been like, sitting on the front line or drumming or whatever, who were just so riled up with their passion <coughs> and with their frustration. And there were, I saw a moment where a particular person did sort of shout out a slightly, slightly antagonistic phrase because he was getting frustrated. And this other guy from just a, across the lawn where we were sitting just came over and basically just came and held him in his arms and just gave him a hug and was like, brother, brother, don't do this, it's okay, you know? I can I feel your pain, I feel your frustration. And he was, he just got, the, the guy who shouted out just got really tearful because it was just all coming from frustration and like not being heard and be, being impotent and powerless. And there were so many beautiful examples of people supporting each other to drop into the feeling behind the anger and underneath the rage and underneath the desire to, to attack or to destroy things and actually go, no, we are here to, to be loving. And like one of the main, um, I heard quite a few times on different stages, people reading out the main principles of the movement and non-violence was absolutely up there. There were four main principles, and non-violence was just such such a big one. Mm -hmm. And it was respect for the police and government. That was like number one. It was non-violent protest. It was no drugs and alcohol. And there's another one I can't remember what it was. But, um, but, but that was just not criticizing or mm -hmm. blaming or uh, no, it was shame. responsibility. Shame. It was taking that, responsibility. Yeah. It was responsibility mm -hmm. for yourself and for your actions for how you behaved and for what it is that we're doing as individually and as a movement. And the, the non-blame, non-judgment, that I think that comes into the respect part. Yeah. Respect, for yeah. people, respect for government, respect for those who are not with us, yeah. who don't maybe understand or don't get it or just haven't woken up to it. Yeah. Um, I, th I think that we are in the question and answer, by the way. I think that's what's happened. I think we're in it. Um, and I also... I know Should we tell someone? 
Yeah, we've got this room till eight. I'm going to make sure that we wrap up with at least five minutes to spare. But if we haven't finished and we want to go and sit out on the lawn and, and chat, then I'm happy to do that. So, yes, we are in the question and answer. Shall we sit down? Yeah, all right. <laughs> I'm going to sit down.
they are not people of truth. Certainly, yeah. within the space yeah. of our yeah. yeah. we are expected to give a balance. Very good. Yeah. 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 Where we talk about climate denial as well, and the inverted commas evidence for this. Mm. Personally, I've made a choice to stop doing that, but that is, according to the national curriculum, that's what we should be doing. And it's very slapdash. It's there isn't a full coverage, and there's certainly not a picture of the truth in any one thing that we're doing. Why that change? Hopefully. Yeah. And there's a lot of teachers who are just now going in and teaching that, doing and regardless of what the government <laughs> are allowing or not allowing, we're just going on with it. Which is a rebellion in itself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the basic fact carbon dioxide absorbs more heat from the sun than the other gases in the atmosphere. And if you put more in, there will be a warming of the whole atmosphere to the point where it could be dangerous. It was known in the 19th century. Yeah. Mm. It's taken a while for it to get there. Isn't it? But some people did see that there's going to be trouble yeah. right in the yeah. beginning of the Industrial Revolution quite early on. Somebody told me this. They found yeah, it. it's been yeah. in somewhere in the media recently. This mm. fact was being. It's on Radio Four. It was on today, yeah. actually. I heard yeah. that. Was it? Yeah. But I mean, we were really aware of it in 1970. Mm -hmm. so, you know, but there wasn't ever any. <coughs> 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 it's true. Can I go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have. Yeah, because this even like the future now requires like political change, not just individual change. But like, what would you feel if people are not like what outcomes they want? From politically or from individuals? Yeah, is there any? So the, the, the stance was that number one, they want the government to tell the truth, so to actually acknowledge the extent of the damage that's being done by human action and what will happen or what could happen as a result of that and how quickly. So the phrases and the statistics that I kept hearing, um, it's a really powerful statement on the, on the Extinction Rebellion website, on the declaration incredibly powerful statement about what they hold true, um, to be true, um, but the bit that, that really stuck with me was the fact that um, the government aren't telling enough people that the IPCC has stated that within 12 years, um, if we don't make urgent changes to the way in which we release carbon dioxide and use fossil fuels, that there will be catastrophic and irreversible changes to the climate and to our ecosystems which could or probably will, almost certainly will, lead to um, ecological collapse, societal breakdown, and mass extinction, mm -hmm. and that that's not being spoken about. Mm -hmm. um, their second demand was to, um, uh, for there to be uh, carbon zero emissions by 2025, 2025 rather than 2050, which is what they had committed to. Um, and then the um, third statement was citizens' yes, 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 to allow yeah. to have a citizens' assembly to advise the government as to mm -hmm. kind of courses of action as to what to do next. So that's what the, the change yeah. that they're hoping for is, and the, the, more, the more recent, which isn't one of the official tenets, but the more recent thing is to there's an early day motion that's been proposed to Parliament by Caroline Lucas, head of the Green Party, to declare a climate and ecological emergency, yeah. whereby across parties. Party, uh, there would be a party collaboration. <laughs> that sounds like tomorrow. Um, and such, such, such that um, across parties there would be sanctions that could be put in place that doesn't then just become a partisan thing about like who are you going to vote for. Because the problem is, uh, the way I understand it, which I don't understand politics very much at all, but what little I do understand is the problem is, is that any government that suddenly imposes huge changes or sanctions or, or whatever it is, it's not the right word. Um, all that's going to happen is they just won't get voted for at the next mm. election. It's short-term thinking. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. So, A, we need to get people on side who are then going to vote for those governments. <coughs> oh, can you explain this to me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you say that? <laughs> you're um, the communicator. <laughs> yeah, you're the knowledge. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we need to get people on side who are going to vote for those governments. Um, but also, um, we need to get something that the governments have to then work together on, or, or that is underpinning the whole of the of all, all the MPs. So, and so, this early day motion is what where people are being encouraged to write to their MPs 
people are being encouraged to write to ask them to um, support this particular early day motion. Well, I have several questions, but they are like me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't really understand where the movement come from, like Lewis Smith, uh, where does it come from? Who, like, when? Okay, I think. Okay, go on. Maybe all questions and mm -hmm. yep. And so, and how it, or it is organized around all the UK, like, mm -hmm. is there like some committee which, um, how does it work uh, to keep, like, and how it's gonna keep going? Like, what is the, the future okay. of the movement? Like Great, so I think what I'll do is I'm going to park that question because that is your ending, really, isn't it? Very interesting to me, and we'll sort it well. Do it okay. us, but yeah, go on. Um, and I'll, I'll go to Dietro and ask. Yeah, I tell you, it's kind of linked. I mean, I, okay. think, I, think there's, I think there's what I think I've heard and I've seen is that this is a revolution in how people do protest. As much as anything else, yeah. you know, it's it's what you were describing about that people's assembly in, in Oxford Circus. I mean, we stuck, we strive towards in. I think Occupy also was. The, I, I, you know, I, I hope you know. I feel that maybe Occupy was a step towards it, yeah. but 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 you know, the, just like you know, the kind of the whole, the the the, the attitude, of, the relationship with the police, the attitude of the police. That's revolutionary, you know, as far as as far as protest goes. Um, the the fact that we don't really know the names of any of the people who. Lead it. I mean, there's one or two that have come through, but you know that's extraordinary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know that, that, that this is such a big thing. You know the impact, the the fact, the way the impact. People always have, people have always said if you want to get column inches, if you want to get coverage on the nine and ten o'clock news, you have to be violent. You have to make a stink. You have to you know you know you have to create noise and blood and, and all that stuff. And that this completely got loads of column inches and loads of coverage without any of that. I mean that is revolutionary. I think we are in different political territory from where we were two years ago, and that two weeks ago, sorry, and that is, you know, extraordinary. So that links to the planning and the the question about where it came from and how it's organised. 